This is RTP. This is RTP 180. Thank you all so much for coming out to see my talk. I'm just glad that all the uh, preliminary talks were way better than this one's going to be. No. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Neese, and I work at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. And I am here tonight to tell you a big secret. It's kind of an open secret. If you've lived in the state, maybe you already know this. But astronauts used to come to Moorhead Planetarium in Chapel Hill on the campus of UNC and train in celestial navigation and stellar identification. Here are a couple of them actually getting their diplomas from UNC. Yeah, this is a special instance. We don't just give away our diplomas, right? <laughs> In order to understand how astronauts ended up here and not in New York City or Chicago or one of the other places where planetariums exist, you really have to understand the journey of this one man, Tony Genzano. He was the eventual director of the planetarium, but in his youth, he came from modest circumstances. He was born to uh, two Italian immigrants born and raised in Philadelphia, and after he finished high school, he went into the Navy. And then he fought in World War II on the Pacific Front. Here he is with some of his shipmates. At the tail end of that war, at the tail end of that war, they had to repatriate all of the Americans who were in the Pacific. So remember that, that's really important. Part of the training that he got while he was in the Navy was he learned to be a master electrician and he was a mechanical genius. Uh, and of course, he knew the night sky because that's just part of your survival training. If you want to be able to get home safely, then you have to know the night sky. Well, after the war was over, he went back home and tried to find a job, just like all of the vets, right? Well, he found his job at the Fells Planetarium uh, in Philadelphia, and he was in charge of the star machine. It was his job to make the stars shine. Well, when the planetarium director said, hey, Tony, I'm going to go down to this, this tiny little town in North Carolina uh, called Chapel Hill, and I'm going to run the planetarium there. It's called Moorhead. Uh, well, when, when the director got there, he said, I can't survive without Tony, because not only are they building this building, they're also putting together a star machine, which is exactly the same make and model that Tony was already familiar with. Tony was the only American alive, the only person in this country who knew how to take apart a star machine and put it back together. And it came in 14 separate boxes. So here he is with a Swedish technician uh, where they're building it together. So on opening day, everything went fine, but they said, hey, Tony, do you mind sticking around? We really need your expertise. So Tony got on the phone, called his wife, and said, we're moving to North Carolina. <laughs> so you may be asking yourselves the question, OK, well, what, what about Tony? What's so special about him? Well, he had a high school diploma. He's working on a college campus. They would really, really like to have a PhD in charge of this facility. Well, the, the director left. He had a TV show. He was the Mr. Wizard of his day. So suddenly Tony was left to manage the planetarium. So here he is with uh, John Motley Moorhead III and some school children. And he carried on the mission. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He was uh, teaching school kids how to identify the stars. Um, but then suddenly, in 1958, they, there was this organization called NASA, and they said, we're going to have astronauts, star sailors. And these star sailors are going to have to be able to find their way home using the stars. So they called up Tony. That was the next logical move, right? You don't, you don't call up the Hayden Planetarium up in New York City. You don't call the Adler, the oldest planetarium with a great reputation in Chicago. You don't call them. You call Tony. Tony Genzano, he's got a reputation. Well, it turns out there are a lot of reasons that they chose Chapel Hill. First, we have a university, so we have an astronomy program that's right on the same campus. Uh, we had the most advanced star machine in the world. It turns out when the NASA called, uh, the star machine was undergoing a major upgrade, and it made it the most advanced star machine on the planet at that time. Also, think about this, if you are uh, trying to put your astronauts from Langley, which is the uh, early center of astronaut training, if you're trying to get them on flight paths to Cape Canaveral or to Houston, well, there's Chapel Hill, here are all the other planetariums. 
which one are you going to choose? Also, if you are going to a major city, what do you have to contend with? Population, traffic. Other people are going to try to see those star shows and they try to squeeze in the theater. Well, here we have 12,000 people. Come on down. We'd love to have you at our planetarium. Um, but I think the, the real reason that they came, they saw, they liked, and they stayed was because of the people. And here are just some of the trainers who uh, are actually in the Star Theater, uh, you know, giving these uh, presentations. You can see some school children behind, uh, uh, this is John Glenn, in case you didn't know. Um, yeah, so these are uh, some of the people that were involved with the training of these astronauts. Feel free to ask me any questions at the Q&A if you want to know more about them and their lives. They're fascinating. But I think it's really because of Tony and his wife Myrtle, they were the consummate hosts, and they kept these astronauts protected and sheltered. They felt like they had a home here in Chapel Hill. They weren't being chased by autograph seekers. They didn't have to give interviews, maybe once while they were in town, and then the rest of the times, never. So what did the astronauts learn? They learned 37 stars later on. In the early days, it was 57, but they had to learn their positions so that they could aim their spacecraft. If they got the attitude exactly right, then you get to return to Earth. Good prize, right? That's a <laughs> if you aim it wrong, you can skip off of the Earth's atmosphere and go flying off into outer space forever. Or if you come in too steeply, you burn up uh, on re-entry. So they had to know these stars. They had to know their correct positions. During their off hours, they went to all of our restaurants. They went to the Zoom Zoom and the Rathskeller. And yeah, Merritt's was actually a gas station in those days. Don't worry about that. But it turns out that that was a gas station where this young lady was a little girl at the time, overheard these pilots talking about when their equipment flamed out and they had to make these dangerous decisions. So she went on and became a uh, helicopter pilot in the Navy for about 30 years. But what is the effect of teaching all of these astronauts all about the stars? Well, this is the most compelling case. This is Gordon Cooper in the Faith 7 mission. It's the last of the Mercury missions. Everything fritzed out. All of his equipment died. All of his secondary backup equipment, it died. He had to look out of the window of his spacecraft, find three stars that he knew should be outside in that exact direction as he was going for splashdown, and he flew the thing manually by stick to the most accurate splashdown of any of the Mercury astronauts. <laughs> there are lots of other emergencies uh, that we can talk about. Everybody knows Apollo 13, and of course, Jim Lovell was on, also on Apollo 8. Um, Apollo 12 was struck twice by lightning as it was lifting off the launch pad. So they had to reset some, uh, some systems, and they had to double check against the stars to make sure everything's right. And in case you didn't notice, yes, that is Neil Armstrong sitting on a front porch in Chapel Hill back in the heyday. I bring up Apollo 7 just to say, this information was used all the time. It wasn't just when there was an emergency, it was on every single mission. It's really sexy to talk about all the emergencies, right? That's, that's very cool. But if you have a standard mission where things could have gone wrong, but they were aiming you know, their spacecraft correctly according to the stars, then they, you don't hear about it because it all worked out. So in every single mission, this was really important training that they all had to go through. So director Tony Genzano, he oversaw all of the cool technicians and all of the equipment. There we go. He helped fabricate the different Gemini chair simulators and things like that. He even oversaw the uh, swap out of one star machine for another. And we trained lots of astronauts, did I mention? Did I mention that we trained? We trained 62 astronauts. So anybody who uh, went on in Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, uh, we got all, I think almost all of those astronauts. And so I'll just give you some, some nice photos of some of them. So Tony Genzano's legacy, he started from humble beginnings, had no idea that he, with his high school diploma, would one day not just be bringing boys home from a mission well done to be in the safety of their homes, but that suddenly he would be in charge of this major facility, the first one in the South, the first one on a college campus, the one that trained 62 astronauts. So that's our secret that now we can all share.